Okay. Uh, this passage at the bottom of four that goes over to the uh, top of five, so he's imagining a robot that uh, responds to things, makes a certain mark on the tape when there's visible lightning, makes a different one when there's thunder, uh, marks what the places are, and so he thinks sets up this global isomorphism between the way things are uh, out there and the way things are uh, on the tape of the robot. Um, now, he makes a, an important claim about this that I wanted to remark on. Um, the robot comes to contain an increasingly adequate and detailed picture of its environment in a sense of picture which is to be explicated in terms of the logic of relations. Uh, I mean, he mentions a map here, and I think uh, that's important. Uh, so this sense of uh, what he's saying is that the, uh, the first claim is that the tape will end up being a map of uh, the environment. Now, how do you think about the relation between a map and the terrain that it's a map of? Uh, I think the right way to think about it is uh, it works because you can make inferences from map facts to terrain facts. So uh, you have to be able to, to be aware of the map fact that there's a squiggly blue line between these two black dots. And infer from that the terrain fact that you can't go from Pittsburgh to Columbus without crossing a river. Uh, to be able to, to navigate by the map is to be able to make the inferences from map facts, that is, facts specified in the vocabulary that applies to the map, about squiggles and dots and so on, two facts about the terrain. And he's saying there will be this mapping relation. That's crucially not all there is to picturing. There's more to the picturing relation than that. That's a necessary condition of it, but it's only part of it. And, and the other part of it, I think, is really interesting. Oh, this picturing cannot be abstracted from the mechanical and electronic processes in which the tape is caught up. The patterns on the tape do not picture the robot's environment merely by virtue of being patterns on the tape. They do map it merely in virtue of being patterns on the tape. I mean, the map just is the map, the tape, but they don't picture just in virtue of that. What, what more is he talking about here? In Wittgenstein's phrase, the method of projection of the map involves the manner in which the patterns on the tape are added to, scanned, and responded to by the other components or the robot. It's a map only by virtue of the physical habitus of the robot. He's been using this term habitus to talk about dispositions i.e. by virtue of mechanical and electronic propensities which are rooted ultimately in its wiring diagram. I think what he's invoking here is the subjunctive robustness of the relation, that it's got to be that if the terrain were different, the map would be different. That's what's ensured by the processes uh, that he's talking about. He says, a distant analogy to this picturing is the way in which the wavy groove of a phonograph record pictures the music which it can reproduce. This picturing also cannot be abstracted from the procedures involved in making and playing the record. So uh, aside from uh, what might be an accidental isomorphism between the map and the terrain. Well, let me put it another way. Um,
any physical object uh, can be mapped isomorphically onto the terrain facts. Right? There's a way of describing, uh, there's a vocabulary I could use to describe this cup. Uh, which I better put down, I'm going to be waving it around. It's stuff in it. Um, I can gerrymander a description of this uh, so that that description is isomorphic with you know, the terrain between Pittsburgh and uh, Columbus. Uh, if I can just make arbitrary sort of divisions of it and say, okay, that's this bit and this bit is representing Columbus and so on, uh, you can can find an isomorphism between any two, between any two objects. Uh, if you're not restricted to antecedent vocabularies to describe it, if I can carve it up any way I like. Uh, so, so it could be regarded as a map of uh, the terrain, uh, but it wouldn't count as picturing it. Uh, it would only count as picturing it if it were produced in a systematic way that underwrote these subjunctive conditionals, that if the terrain were different, this would have been different in that, uh, in that regard. Uh, Sellers is claiming here that that's an essential element of Wittgenstein's notion of a method of projection for his notion of picturing. That's a strong claim. About, uh, uh, about what's going on in Wittgenstein with, with that, that, that it really is uh, this richer notion that uh, uh, he's invoking. Um, now, this footnote, uh, I just want to... Uh, Register that it's here. Uh, he says, strictly speaking, it's the singular sentences on the tape which picture the environment, not just the objects. Here we think about um, the point of jumblees, that it's the fact that uh, the A is to the left of B that uh, pictures that the lightning came before the thunder. Uh, that, that's the point he's making here. A discussion of the way in which the robot pictures what is, of the way in which the robot pictures what is printed on its tape would require additional distinctions. The central theme would be that the language of picturing is truth functional. It's hard for me to know what he's after here, particularly because these subjunctive conditionals, he's just told us. Uh, are of the essence of the picturing, uh, of the picturing relation. So I don't know whether he's making a, a deep true point here, or uh, a shallow but true point, or whether he's making a mistake. Uh, I, I don't know how to fill this in, but it's possible that it's deep and true, and uh, you know, something I don't understand. So, so I, I, I just wanted to point out that he makes this this interesting claim. That, Maybe somewhat related, but in talking about the map, um, you mentioned that it has to be able to be used for making certain inferences in certain sort of ways. But in its being a map, that somehow, that conceptual concept is not already articulated in it, right? Because then it wouldn't be just part of the real order, it would be part of the intentional order, too, right? So is it, is it more like a matter of it? providing the basis upon which you can use to make these sort of inferences, but not having that content within it? Well, so, so good question. In, you know, when I talk about the map facts, uh, if you talk about all the facts about the map, well, I put my coffee cup down on it, and it has this circular coffee stain on it, which uh, is not a map fact in the sense that you can make inferences from it to terrain facts. But in another sense, it's a fact about the map, as is how wide the margins are in it, and so on. So if you're going to treat it as a, uh, as a map, you've got to restrict the vocabulary and say, 
Well, not everything that's true of this physical object, which is a map, is a map fact. Only the things describable in this restricted vocabulary, the ones that correspond to the key uh, uh, there, that's not just telling us how to make the inferences, it's telling us what facts matter. And I say, well, the brown of this coffee stain, I don't see it. It says the blue is water and the green is trees, and there, there isn't brown for this. And I say, well, that's not in the map vocabulary then that, that we're um, uh, giving you here. Uh, we have the little thing that says that the distances are part of the map uh, and, and how to make the inferences uh, from that. And I hear you asking, well, you know, if we're talking about isomorphism set up by, say, natural processes, what gives us the restricted vocabulary uh, in virtue of which there's this isomorphism, given that if we don't have that restriction, any two things you know, can be treated as mapping uh, one another, even if not picturing because uh, 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 not robust. And I think this is a really deep issue with his notion of picturing. Uh, I think he thinks that the point about subjunctive robustness answers it. Uh, that that uh, you have to look at uh, that the in treating it as a picturing relation, you've got to be committing yourself as to the method of projection, uh, which the way I'm translating that is committing yourself to the subjunctive conditionals that, that are made true by the process of producing, uh, the process of picturing, producing the picture. Uh, there's a job of work to do to get from those subjunctive conditionals, which also are expressed in some vocabulary, to uh, uh, a, pic a picturing relation, you know, one, one among one among many, and, and one would worry about gerrymandering, you know, the subjunctive conditionals as well, the the method of projection. So I think there's a deep issue that you're pointing to about seeing this as being in the real mm -hmm. order and exactly where we, what is it that privileges the vocabularies because we need to privilege some of them in order to see these, to see these relations. Um, now, um, so, um, really quickly, uh, he says, so we could also think about what the robot's doing in the order of signification. We could treat what's there as symbols, as having meanings. Uh, and the right way to think about that then would be to see an analogy between the functional role played by this symbol in the method of projection, the method of picturing of the uh, robot on the one hand and our word lightning uh, on the other. The sort of thing that he would express using the, the dot quotes. Uh, uh, where he's saying that this notion of signification asserts a relation between an, it's tempting to think the signification expresses a relation between an item in the order of signification the German word mensch, uh, and an item in the real world, man, or, you know, if you, if you don't like the nature man, it can just be Socrates and Socrates uh, here. Um, but nothing could be further from the truth. It's really about two items in the order of signification. It says, in effect, that the word mensch has the same use as the English word man. Um, and his next point is, look, there's an obvious difference between mensch signifies man and mensch has the same use as man. Uh, this is what the display case, it has to be something in your, in your language. So the word man is used either predicatively or mentioned. There's no such thing as it's used to stand in for an absolute uh, uh, nature. 
So the heart of my contention is that the basic role of signification statements is to say that two expressions, at least one of which is in our own vocabulary, have the same use. So this is to respond to the translation problem and the uh, getting the counterfactuals wrong problem with this sort of uh, translation. Uh, so picturing is a relation between items, both of which belong to the real order. Signification is a relation between items, both of which belong in the order of signification. Uh, the Thomists think that uh, the way in which the content man or triangle shows up in the mental word is a relation between an item in the real order and an item in the order of signification, in the order of signification in the intentional order. And the only way they can do that is saying that the matter that is informed, well, it isn't matter, it's immaterial. Uh, that's the way they're fudging this uh, move between the two, between the two orders. That's uh, Seller's diagnosis and his hermeneutic analysis of what immaterial means in the Thomistic system on the side of intellect. He's already said where he thinks the mistake the sort of corresponding but not strictly structural, structurally identical mistake on the side of senses, but, but here's the mistake on the side of um, uh, the intellect, that there's really two kinds of isomorphism, a picturing one that's entirely within the real causal order, and one of signification that's entirely in the normative conceptual order, and they've replaced that with a relation, a single isomorphism relation, one end of which is in the real order and the other of which is in the conceptual order. And, and the way they did that was by inventing a notion of immaterial formation, uh, something taking the form immaterially. That's his uh, diagnosis. Um, now, of course, he wants to say how it really is, and he does very briefly First in 53, these two isomorphisms are quite different, belong to two different universes of discourse. This is two thirds of the way down on six. Um, there is nevertheless an intimate connection between them, which can be put by saying that our willingness to treat this pattern on the tape as a symbol which translates our word lightning, signifies, rests on the fact that we recognize there's an isomorphism in the real order between the pattern in the functioning of the robot and the place of lightning in its environment. In this sense, this sense rests on, we can say that the isomorphism in the real order between the robot's electronic system and its environment is a presupposition of the isomorphism in the order of signification. Well, okay, but we need to hear a lot more about the rests on and presupposes. So this is where the two orders meet is uh, how these two uh, line up. Uh, it's what, if you remember uh, uh, going back, uh, these two dimensions of epistemic tracking and semantic governance uh, are talking about this same thing. Uh, 56, at, at the top of page 7, is where he pointed us right at the beginning. Remember, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about this in section 56. If one confuses picturing with signifying, and if one takes the signifying to be a relation between the word and the real, then, since both signifying and picturing are isomorphisms, one will think of the actualities which token the word as isomorphic in the Aristotelian sense with the physical actualities which embody the absolute nature man, that is, individual men. And one will put this by saying the actualities which token the word embody the absolute nature man, though in a unique way, which we label immaterial, because it's not a man in the sense in which Socrates is. The thought of the triangle isn't a triangle in the sense in which the Nazi uh, triangle is. So, um, 
concept, uh, looking down a little, the concept of the mental word carries with it both dimensions of isomorphism. Then we can say the mental sentences which inform the intellect in its first and second acts are the counterparts of sentences in the vocabulary of overt speech. So the mental sentence, it is raining, is the inner counterpart of our English sentence, it's raining. This is an isomorphism in order of signification, analog of translation. And if the argument to date is sound, this isomorphism implies that qua belonging to the real order, the intellect pictures the world, i.e. is related to the real order as the electronic state of the anthropoid robot is related. So I think we should understand him as wanting to be entitled to say this and uh, leaving as a task for another day explaining exactly what the relationship is here. Uh, so, and I wish I could tell you sort of how that, how that went, but um, I can't. And he used to get really irritated when I asked him uh, about that. But something like this has to be true. But I, I called this essay gem-like and more fully realized than many of his. I hope you appreciate just how pretty the story he's telling here is, this diagnosis of the Thomistic uh, account of what's right about it, what's wrong about it, and how he can use it as a, uh, a guide to saying how things really are. And clearly, this is sort of the way he thinks about things. Uh, but this really is a paradigm of uh, uh, a certain kind of philosophy. And, uh, uh, he, he, he thought this way, but this, this one really exhibits how it is when it works, I guess, even though it stops short of everything we would like.